incredible finish, incredible stage there, stage nine of 2017. We just saw that our guest, Dan Martin, found a way to finish ninth. We now know, three years later, that he did so with two fractured vertebrae in his back. Uh, three years later now, Dan, how do you make sense of what you accomplished on that day? It's just bike racing, isn't it? It's adrenaline. It's like, I remember, it was actually like, once I got up and got going again, we got a front wheel that seems to take forever from the Mavic's new neutral service. The, um, I arrived at the next corner and my, because of the, the wheel that they've given me was a little bit narrower, my front brake didn't work. I didn't know it at this point. So I came into this next corner at like 40 miles an hour and uh, had no brakes. I just had my back brake. So I ended up careering off into the forest and luckily didn't hit, like avoided the trees and had a soft landing in the, in the, in the grass. But it's, um, so yeah, that was then, by the time I got back onto the road, luckily my team car saw me coming back on and managed to give me a spare bike. Because then that, that bike wow. was kind of, yeah. But I remember just this pure adrenaline of the crash and obviously all the endorphins flowing from the injuries. That obviously I never knew that I'd hurt myself that badly. At that point I didn't even feel my back. Like I remember just doing the rest of the downhill. I was overtaking so many riders. <laughs> just because I was on a mission, you know, and it was just, it's, it's amazing what the body can do. And it's in a, in that flight or, or flight mode. At what point did you know that you had some kind of injury in your back? I could feel it, but it wasn't like, it felt more like a muscle spasm, you know, I never, never imagined that I'd even like have a, have a fractured vertebrae, you know, and it, like even going forward in the race towards Paris, like, I never took a single painkiller, never had time, never had problems sleeping. Like it was, uh, it was just when I stopped, when I, when I woke up two days after Paris, I literally could barely get out of bed, you know? So it's when it's obviously my body was, it was my body's way of just, it had a way of keeping itself going. It knew, it knew what was required to, it, it knew what it worked so hard for, you know? Appreciate you sharing a little bit about that crash that we didn't see on camera when you went off into the forest and you said landed soft and got a break and were able to get back on uh, with the help of a new bike eventually. But I want to go back to that moment uh, that so many of us remember that crash with you and Richie Port right after it happened. It was very clear that something was seriously wrong with Richie Port, that he had major injuries. You were on the ground next to him and I saw you glance at him for a moment. You got up again to your bike and then while your bike was getting ready, you were just watching Richie. I'm wondering if you remember what your feelings were as you were banged up, but you were going to get back on your bike and you're looking back at someone you respect who's down in a world of pain. It was hard because obviously we're all, we're competitors and we know each other very well. And Richie's actually like, since that moment, we've actually become good friends, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, before that we'd always taught and we kind of made a pact because we, we realized that, like we'd be, we were kind of like lone, lone soldiers for our teams in, in that tour. So we kind of made a pact to sort of work together a little bit, you know, and then it was a gentleman's agreement kind of not to hinder each other, you know, and kind of help each other out when we can. Like it might be, be something completely insignificant, but it's just that, that little hand on your back to when you're suffering or something, you know, just to, we, we were we had a very good relationship with him to, I remember him saying to me that he was just gutted that it was me that he brought down. Of, of all the people in that group, he was like, I was the one person he was absolutely like the worst person possible. So if you had to take somebody down, it was me that he didn't want to take down, you know, and it was, it's, uh, it just happens, you know, so it's a racing instant. And obviously, obviously at that point, I could see he was okay. He was moving and that's the most important thing. And then I just had to concentrate on my job of getting to the finish as fast as possible. As horrible as that moment was, I'm sure it developed uh, camaraderie and chemistry, just like you just talked about. So for the next 12 stages, while you were racing with an injured back and he was in a hospital uh, starting to rehab, what kind of communication did you have with him texting back and forth or calling just because you two were forever connected to that stage from that moment? Yeah, he was texting me encouragements, like for sure, you know, and it was, uh, yeah, he just felt terrible. You know, because he saw how well I was riding as well. And it was, um, yeah, I mean, I think 
it was really hard for him, you know, because it's like it's that guilt, you know. It's when it's the same for me when I took my team down in the Giro d'Italia team time trial in 2014. You just have this guilt that you've caused harm to people you respect, you know. And that's it's something just quite difficult to, to overcome. But yeah, we, we we definitely laugh about it now. You know, it's like not laugh, but it's obviously it's a horrific situation for him. But it's it's a spectacular piece of footage and a piece of Tour de France history. Isn't it crazy that as awful as it was, you guys can kind of chuckle and laugh about it now? Well, I'm not sure laughing was the right word to use, you know, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, we definitely found our pay, place in the, in, in the history books for the wrong right. reasons. We should be thankful that we weren't both more seriously hurt. Right. No, it's a very good point. You ended up finishing sixth in 2017. You came back in the top 10 once again. The next year of the tour in 2018, you finished eighth. Uh, so a couple of top 10 finishes. Uh, I'm wondering if you feel a little more proud of the top 10 finish from 2017 because of how you were able to overcome that crash. Well, I actually had a really bad crash in 2018 too. So <laughs> it's kind of like both of them were, were with adversity, you know. But I think with 2017, they're very different tours, like every tour is. But it was very much, I have an overwhelming feeling of what could have been because of, how well I was riding, you know, I mean, I lost, I think I finished four and a half, five minutes behind Chris in the end, in, in Paris, and I lost probably a minute and a half that day, you know, and if I had a stage in that front group that day, I would have been very close to the yellow jersey still, going to the third rest day, and who knows what can happen from that point, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, but you can't change the history, you know, and, and whereas 2018 was very much a, a year that had been a very difficult start. I had quite a weak team behind me and, and I was isolated for long periods of the stages. So it was yeah, two very different achievements. I'm incredibly proud of both, you know, and it's, uh, so yeah, I mean, but the, yeah, I, I never, I mean, the Tour de France is hard as it is, but I just seem to make it as hard as possible each year, which is something I really, did. I really want to try and hit the tour without making it extra difficult. Yes. It, it makes for great viewing and it makes, uh, makes for a lot of fans out there, but the fact that you end up making it difficult, I think it, it wins over a lot of people the way you end up riding. So let's spin it forward now. 2020 tour coming up August 29th. We look forward to it very much here uh, on NBC. You have top 10 finishes at the tour. You have stage wins. Let's peek into the top five. And what's next for you? Top five finish? Would, would that be a proper next goal? Podium? Or are you really thinking about winning this thing? Honestly, I don't know. You know, we're, like, we've talked to the team a little bit about this, but obviously with, with Israel starting on Asian's first Tour de France and the first like Tour de France for an Israeli team, and it's the stage victory is the most important goal for this Tour de France. So what we have to do to achieve that, you know, uh, like GC is getting harder and harder to, to, to achieve now. You have these multiple super teams controlling the race. And that also makes winning stages more difficult if you're sniffing around fifth, sixth, seventh on GC. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not ruling out the GC, but the, the main goal for this year was to win a stage. And yeah, we'll just see how we can do that. Obviously. This year has been in some parallel with what we've had to deal with as professional cyclists. And I just hope that we actually get to race at the tour this year because obviously it's what the riders want, it's what the people at home want to see as well. And I'm sure you guys want to come, want to commentate it as much as we want to race. So I, know, I just hope we we'll get to uh, do what we love doing this year and, uh, and put on a show. And then, yeah, I'm going in there into the race. Yeah, really relaxed with what my goals and what my ambitions are because it's like, it's not. I don't feel pressure to, uh, to, to achieve anything really, just, just to enjoy racing, because when I enjoy racing my bike, I, I get results. There you go. Uh, so two stage wins in one, in one tour has not happened. So maybe, maybe if there's multiple stage wins, that's a big step in the right direction. Exactly, yeah. You know, and I mean, who knows what, we'll, what we can do. I mean, it's an incredibly difficult tour this year incredibly difficult you know so it's gonna and the weather conditions are gonna be diff different to what we would normally face no doubt you know so it's uh yeah it's gonna be interesting i mean we might even see some snow at the end of the race which we don't really see at the tour de france normally you know in september in the alps 
who knows what's going to happen. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's, it's going to be it's going to throw even more challenges at, at us than it normally does. Incredibly difficult tour, you said. So in giving support to that, what's number one at the top of the list making it most difficult? The course. I think there is not. There's barely a sprinter stage in the whole race. I think there's there's one or two after the first rest day, but overall, it's uh, yeah, every day is testing, it's challenging physically. Whereas it's quite rare for the Tour de France to be like that, you know. It's not normally you get a lot of days that are difficult psychologically. You need to have concentration to avoid crosswinds or splits or just intense sprint finishes, but. I think this year's Tour de France just seems like a, every day seems like a mountain stage almost. It's, it's insane. So it's going to be uh, that last week will be it will be brutal for sure. Be, there'll be a lot of fatigue around, and there'll be a lot of opportunities for stage victories. So we'll just try and take some. I would imagine if history is any indication, you're going to be right in the middle of a couple of those stages. Uh, hopefully, as a stage winner, good luck on that. But also with some courageous and bold riding because we always end up seeing that from you at the tour. So Dan Martin, we appreciate your time and your thoughts on these last couple shows. No, thanks for the invite. No, no, it's, been really, it's been fun. Cheers. Cheers to you, Dan Martin. Welcome back anytime.